So today our moderator will be Deanna Wiley. Um, she is a Circle of Excellence Realtor with Keller Williams Preferred. She has a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of South Carolina, go Gamecocks, along with an associate's degree in performing arts dance. She has spent six years in the stock market industry working in operations and a few years as a compliance and pricing analyst for a global data warehousing company before taking a leap of faith to build her own business with Keller Williams. So with that, I introduce Deanna Wiley. Hey guys, thank you, Kay. Thanks, every, thanks to everyone for taking the time to be here in your evening. I really do truly appreciate that. Um, we're gonna have a great conversation. Um, tonight is just all about conversation and just you know being there for each other. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, the panelists that we have. We have a great panel tonight and their bio is way more impressive than mine. So <laughs> with that being said, I'll go ahead and first introduce our first panelist, Mayor Steve Benjamin. Mayor Steve Benjamin has been elected mayor in New in a record turnout election in April of 2010, Mayor Steve Benjamin has made it his mission to create in Columbia the most talented, educated, and entrepreneurial city in America. In addition to serving as Mayor of Columbia, Mayor Benjamin also served as the 2018-2019 President of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, Chairman of the Municipal Bonds for America, and Co-Chair of the Mayors for 100% Clean Energy Campaign among other organizations. Mayor Benjamin is married to the Honorable Deandra Giss Benjamin, Chief Administrative Judge for South Carolina's 5th Judicial Circuit, and the two of them are proud parents, her daughters Bethany and Jordan Gray. Mr. Mayor, I'll let you go ahead and say hi to everybody. Hello, everyone. <laughs> thank, you, thank, you, thank you for uh, reading that incredible introduction, just like I wrote. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a, it's an honor to be here with uh, with all of you. Uh, Kay, this is not my last Zoom call of the night. I'm on a late night one. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you let you let West Coast just start messing with the schedule. It gets really wacky on, on the East Coast. Uh, but I've been looking forward um, uh, to to joining you all. Uh, the uh, we talk about the leaders of tomorrow. The reality is that uh, the folks in this call are really doing amazing things across our community today. And I can think of a um, of maybe no time, at least in my life. That's been that much, uh, it's, it's been so important. So I'm glad to be here with you all and look forward to dialogue with my, with my two friends, um, Adi and, and Andre. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> so our next panelist is Dr. Adi Sarvasa and she is the Director of Research of Children's Trust of South Carolina. She leads mixed methods research efforts to adverse childhood experiences, race equity and public opinion to improve community resilience her research has been published in several well-respected peer-reviewed journals. Recently, she was awarded the Honorable Jim Claiborne Health Equity Emerging Leader Award for her research efforts in Columbia. Efforts. And in Columbia, she serves on the City of Columbia Complete Count Committee, Columbia Opportunity Resource, and is in Leadership Columbia Class of 2021. She received her PhD from the University of South Carolina as a Doris Duke Foundation fellow and has her undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia. Hi, Audity. Hi, I'm going to save our time to chat. So, uh, last but not least. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, our next, our last but not least panelist is Andre Goodman. Andre is a youth program manager at United Way of the Midlands. Andre leads the Empowerment Action um, Council Build with Protective Factors, coordinates resilient Richland awareness events, and conducts adverse childhood experience training. Joining United Way of the Midlands most recently from the University of South Carolina's athletic department where he worked with student athletes to enhance their academic and personal journey. Hi, Andre. Uh, good evening uh, to everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. I think those bios probably highlight how much I'm out of my intellectual depth with my two panelists. So you guys give me some place here tonight. Uh, that is not true. Yes, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Well, the first I wanted to start it off with a couple of icebreakers. We have a few poll questions that we want to ask our audience for a quick engagement. 
okay whenever you're ready you can just shoot those up and then if everyone wants to just go ahead and take a couple of seconds to just fill those out this will then we'll start our conversation tonight one second we're having some technical difficulties so just bear with me here really quick you're fine i'll use it to take a step While we wait for those, I can go ahead and just start cleaning them. I hope everyone's having a good night tonight. We are, Diana. <laughs> Adi actually knows some really great stories and jokes. Uh, she wants to go and regale us with some of those stories. Uh, we, we, we're, we're, we're all in. Andre and I were just talking about how amazing uh, she is so please Andy, why don't you go ahead i know she is i tried to tell her i was so impressed by her i am okay so while we're waiting for the polls one of the things that i wanted to do anyway was to set kind of a um communal understanding of the different terms that we're going to be using today so the researcher in me is like hold up before we have this conversation everybody's kind of got to be on the same page about what we're talking about and so um, when I was invited to come onto this panel, um, I saw the term equality and equity be used interchangeably. And so when I was um, talking with Melissa and Kay and Deanna, they were very gracious in my feedback, but I said, do you mean equality or do you mean equity? And I think that that's an important distinction for us to think about today as we have our conversation, because I think most of the time what we mean is equity, right? Um, but in a lot of political discourse, in the news, on Twitter, which the mayor knows I love. Um, we often use that very interchangeably, but they're not actually the same thing. So I want you to think about equity as giving people what they need. Imagine if all of us had to enter a step challenge, right? You know how we have those on the Apple Watches or Fitbit or whatever. And all of us had to complete 100 miles by the end of this week. In order to do that, we were all given the same exact pair of shoes. Every single one of us, we were just given the same standard pair of shoes, same size. I mean, that wouldn't work, right? Because all of us have different size shoes. Some of us have different needs. Me, I run a lot, so my knees are always hurting. So maybe I need a little bit more cushioning. Others, they may be one of those amazingly awesome people that can walk miles in heels, right? Everybody has different needs. And so to just give everyone the same thing, that would have been equality, right? But to give people what they need, even if that means giving someone a pricier shoe so they have the same chance of winning that step challenge, that's what equity is. So equity is not always um, giving everybody the same thing. It's, it's, it's giving people what they need. And I think the most important thing, whether we're talking about Columbia or the Midlands or even our country, is that we have to recognize that we must start with equity because we're not starting at the same place in the first place, right? If you look at our historic and systemic racism that's existed in our country for so long. If you look at the policies that kind of govern um, on a late uh, local, state, and national level, you recognize that some things are still in the books that disproportionately benefit one population over others. So the way that I like to think about it is you can't have equality without equity. So I challenge you all to change your kind of terminology when we're talking about these things, because in order for us to really see the Midlands thrive, for Columbia to thrive, we really have to focus on giving communities what they need. And the great part about that is that you're not taking anything away from anyone, right? If you're giving someone down here a little bit more, you're just helping them get that, get to that same starting point. And this group, which probably shouldn't have been up here anyway, is kind of leveling off. And so the whole goal is to level that playing field. Um, so I hope that we, we talk about equity very intentionally in our conversation tonight. And I think the poll is ready, so I think we're ready. And I just answered your first question for you, I'm sorry. No worries, thank you. So if you all would just take a moment to answer these few questions. And there's no right or wrong answer.
So we'll just take a few seconds to get those responses back. And Kev, you'll just let us know when you get those back too. We had to do a little switch through behind the scenes of who has uh, some rights. So we're going to have to go over that at the end of the results and then see, you know, kind of where the answers were. And then I would love to kind of go around and see, you know, how people's answers have changed at the end from the beginning. To the end. Perfect. Sounds good. So what's Oddity explaining equity versus equality? We're going to go ahead and segue into what is the difference between racism and prejudice? Adity, can you take that off for us as well? Yes, so um, we've been hearing a lot of, so this is a, I mean, it's a historic time in so many different ways. And I think that the other panelists would, would agree, um, you know, we're, we're living in this pandemic that we know we don't know when it's gonna end. Communities are more divisive than ever. We're seeing a lot of rhetoric be used that's um, actively harming people of color. Um, and we're also seeing policy decisions one of the things I'd really like for you to take from this discussion is um, that when we're typically talking about racism in our everyday life, we're mostly, uh, most of the time, talking about prejudices and bias, right? It's very easy for a news story to cover an example of racism um, where someone used a slur or a, a bad word um, or, you know, um, graffitied on someone's property some kind of hateful speech. And that's certainly a type of racism, but in order for us, I think, to really um, move forward on some of the social issues that we'd like to change, we got to remove the emotion out of racism. I want you guys to think about racism as systemic. So while that type of racism definitely exists, and I think all of us have a strong grounding of what that is, of, of using, a, you know, using these words or saying hateful things, just focusing on that is not going to help us move the needle in terms of equity, right? So one of the things that a lot of public health scholars have been really looking to do is using the pandemic as a frame for people to understand systemic racism. And systemic racism is really defined as policies, practices, and structures that have been built inherently to benefit a certain group of people. In our country, a lot of times that is your white, male, cis, um, able-bodied population. There are many different types of equity, so you could look at other kind of structures and systems as well, where another group may be an advantage. But for the purposes of our discussion today, we're really talking about race equity, right? And one of the reasons why that's so important is um, race and the conversation of race is al almost always the elephant in the room. So um, again, systemic racism is the policies and practices and structures. And when I say structures, I mean, looking at the ways in which our public services are funded. So one big example of that is education, right? How, are, how is education set up in our country that certain populations may benefit? Or housing, even though we don't have a lot of the discriminatory um, policies that existed several years ago, we can certainly point to several effects that redlining and um, discriminatory loans for housing have caused in terms of these disadvantaged communities all around um, Columbia, around South Carolina, and nationally speaking. So those are the kind of examples that you want to think about. And when you when you start to remove, and I found that, that in my experience, when I started to remove the emotional component of someone calling my friend a bad name or someone saying something hateful and really started to focus on that more systemic level, I was able to kind of comprehend and, and figure out more easily what my actions should be because then I'm starting to look at it more broadly, right? And I'm able to have conversations with people that have very different political views than me or very different kind of worldviews for me and help them understand how we both have the same goal of improving a system. Now, whether I call it systemic racism and somebody call it something, someone else calls it something else, that's another discussion. So systemic racism are policies, practices, and structures. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Adity. Thank you for that example as well. Um, that's gonna kind of segue into, you guys are all leaders in our community and there's several of us that are with YLS and other groups who do want to be leaders or are leaders in the community. And we are trying to determine what expectation we have for ourselves to stand up against racism 
and support equity. What are ways or what made you decide and what expectations did you all have to stand up for or stand up against racism and our for equity? And what do those expectations look like and when did you decide to make a difference? And I'll start with you, Mr. Mayor. I'm trying to follow the rules and be on mute. Uh, I'm at home with two teenage girls and uh, a very small but loud dog, so you never ever know what's going to happen in the background. The um, uh, uh, some of you, gosh, it's maybe two or three stated the cities ago uh, when I decided I was going to do a, a, a bit more deep dive in the personal narrative. We often uh, know we meet people, but we very rarely. Um, uh, we usually re meet people's representatives, not, not, not actually uh, hear their true stories and understand the power of personal narrative. And I, and I, I, I thought I'd tell the very first the story about the very first time I encountered um, uh, racism in my, in, in my life. And uh, it was, uh, I was barely 12 years old. Uh, I grew up in, many of you may not know, I grew up in, in Queens, New York. I didn't grow up in, in Columbia, South Carolina. I tell no one from Columbia that. Please keep that in that little secret right now. I come across nice old ladies and like, you went to high school with my son. And I say, how's he doing? I just keep on going. Uh, just keep, keep, it, keep, it, keep it simple, uh, the way they get carpet bagger. Um, but I, I remember going to a, a, an elementary school that was 100% African-American, one Puerto Rican family. Uh, and then we were, um, we were bust. We were in that, in that phase of New York City busing uh, into a, a neighborhood called Howard Beach. Some of you, if you haven't heard the stories of the Howard Beach murders, it was, it was very um, uh, diverse in terms of European descent, uh, neighborhood, uh, hot bit of racial strife, home of the, of the leader of the Gambino crime family. And um, uh, I remember going to um, uh, the skating rink uh, with my class, uh, my, my, my seventh grade year. We started middle school, at junior high school in seventh grade there. Wonderful uh, trip experience and, and of course, I. Uh, uh, a protected environment and may, having a great idea that we would go back to that skating rink uh, after uh, um, coming home and telling my friends in our neighborhood how wonderful that experience was. We got back that weekend, it was a very different experience, very different experience. Uh, racial expletives, uh, flying skates, getting hit in the face with skates and, and being 11 years old. And, um, and the very first time in my, in my life, face to face with um, uh, race, racism, hostility, violence, it was it was a it was an uh, uh, an arc shaping event for me. Uh, it, it 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 was a, it was the very first time I, I came to uh, grips with that, which I believe is is is, is wrong. It's a crime, and, and why we all try to protect our children and, and, and those we love, or give them enough runway to be children uh, as they possibly can until they have to take on the the uh, the challenges of, of of the world. But that at that, that very moment, as a very, very young child, uh, I became very um, concerned, very engaged, became a student of history um, uh, and, and learning the, the, the story of the African seed and the American sun. And, and, and it, it helped inform my, my years, even to most just years through high school. Uh, but when I finally came to the university as a, as a, as a, uh, as a student, student leader, is when I finally found my voice and got active, very active at that time, uh, the, the, the largest um, uh, uh, discussion across the globe was around apartheid in South Africa. Uh, Nelson Mandela was still in prison in South Africa. The, the, the Confederate battle flag still flew in a sovereign position over the, the state capital uh, here in, in South Carolina. So we found a number of different ways uh, to, to express our voice, and, and, I'll, and I'll say this, and I, I won't, I won't um, go too long because I feel like I'm in a bit of a stream of consciousness right now. My experience at the university, uh, both good and bad, and being able to uh, be in an environment where you had people um, literally from almost every one of the uh, 194 sovereign nations of the world, people from different backgrounds, who, who were from different places, had different ideas. I'd add on to what Adi said earlier about structures that, that may have been built and designed for, for um, white men. I'd also say uh, middle class to upper middle class white men, uh, because you had, we had people we, meet, we met from Appalachia and, and the rural parts of the state who also had been excluded uh, uh, from the, um, the, 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 the American dream over the course of, of their lives, them and their uh, fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers as well. It helped me develop a much more, a much greater appreciation for the idea of, uh, of ideas of race 
and class and caste and, 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 and struggle. And, and that, that these ideas were universal terms that, that, that were global and, uh, and helped inform my worldview uh, to, to understand that people can get to uh, the very same place, see the very same thing, be well-meaning, uh, uh, but, but all suffer from some grave degrees of experiential blindness uh, that we've all seen the world from very different uh, uh, perspectives. And it's our job. Uh, to 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 try, particularly if we're leaders, and I, and I don't mean that as elected leaders. I mean as, as leaders, and everyone, believe me, on this call as a leader, it's our job to try to do our very best to speak truth to these powers and try to do our best to bring people together. And I was I was fortunate enough to learn that from some people who's a, who uh, who I um, uh, I met on my journey along the way, and it's informed my worldview uh, to this day. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Andre or Oddity, would you guys like to add to that? Oh well, yeah, I don't mind adding. I'll, I'll just say for myself, uh, no, I, I personally, I didn't come from much. Um, I, I grew up in poverty. Um, my parents were never married. I never knew my father. Uh, my mother never completed high school. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get an athletic scholarship uh, and become a first uh, generation graduate. Uh, went on to play professional football for a while. And it seemed as if overnight, like my social economic status changed. And within that, I think I start to realize how much, you know, my neighbors changed. Um, the social crowds that I, re I was uh, engaging in changed and, and the conversations within that social crowd kind of changed. And I start to rec recognize like the, the racial disparities within that, that newfound privilege that I had. Um, but I also start to recognize like the personal gaps in my development that allowed, that made it difficult to adjust to those changes. Um, so when I retired, I was fortunate enough to get a position at the University of South Carolina, which is my alma mater. And I was able to work with the student athletes uh, within the athletic department that shared some of those similar experiences and I've been fortunate to be here at United Way with a, a, an amazing group of people to be able to be on the ground and work in communities similar to the ones I grew up in. Uh, and I think the, the expectation has always been to help these families, these kids in a way that they're allowed to kind of explore opportunities for advancement and economic growth that will propel them beyond their current circumstances. So the expectation really is just to start with one kid, one family, one community and kind of go from there. So we've been working to develop like youth mentoring programs and promote life skills and leadership skills that, you know, they're pretty applicable in any and every environment and allows less of a culture shock for these kids when they are able to ex extend beyond their current circumstances. We've also been working to uh, create peer support groups to help families in these communities better recognize and utilize the social supports that are around them and also develop, you know, emotional and social platforms to help reduce some of the stress, stress management. Uh, so those are the ways that I've cho chosen to get involved and I'm hoping that, you know, I'm able to make a difference. And I'm hoping that, you know, as I'm in these communities and I kind of see myself as a child, that I'm able to help these kids advance from you know, their current circumstances in a way that uh, allows them to believe in their dream and allows them to believe beyond what they know. Thank you, Andre. Did you want to add to anything? I would just say, as I reflect on my journey, I think that understanding and working with um, race equity is a unique journey for everyone. I think that there is a room for growth for everyone. Um, so I'm an immigrant's kid. Um, so I moved here um, down to South Carolina about six years ago, but my parents immigrated here about 30 to 40 years ago. And um, I just reflect on all the experiences that we had and um, especially around 9-11, there were not, there were not great experiences. And the way that we responded to them made me realize that immigrants more than anything, they just want to fit in and belong. 
And um, the fact that structures, practices, policies, and as Andre mentioned, social networks are often not set up that way, really made me feel passionate about changing that. Um, you know, I think that my, my, my parents sacrificed a lot to be here, um, just like, you know, so many parents um, do a lot to make sure their kids have a chance. But sometimes that's not even enough, right? And so I think that that has, that has what has really made me a champion for this, specifically for kids, because kids don't choose the cards that they're dealt. And if there is an opportunity to really move the needle, it's with kids. And so that's why a lot of my research and a lot of my work at Children's Trust is geared towards health equity for kids and families. Thank you. So both you and Andre, you know, mentioned the topic of development of youth resilience. I was reading an article and it was talking about how families can be thought of as the soul and the water, the base of trees, and then the schools, the neighborhoods, and the communities, you know, impact that would be like the sun and the rainfall. So accompanying the different types of characteristics of the trees, the soils, the weather conditions, I'm trying to use an analogy like oddity, but I'm probably not sounding as brilliant as she when she was referring to like the shoe <laughs> of us all giving the same shoe and equity. Mm -hmm. it, what to say that is to say that um, that in a similar way, the varying traits of young people and characteristics of their families and the environments can positively or negatively affect young people's health and growth. And that's going to kind of transition into my question for Andre. Do you feel that schools in the Midlands impact youth resilience? Are there certain areas that have a bigger impact on youth resilience? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think teachers and school administrators have frequently been recognized as positive role models for uh, kids, especially outside of their family circles. Um, and I think schools have a way of providing that connectedness that makes students feel safe and close and feel like they're a part of something and make, the teachers have a way of you know make them feel cared for and make them feel safe while they're attending school um i think even throughout the midlands our schools have kind of start to recognize the importance of um the social and emotional wellness and they they embedded the social and emotional learning within that curriculum and it kind of allows those students to practice and learn skills um that lend to resiliency, uh, whether it be learning to cooperate within a team, learning how to uh, create uh, healthy relationships, learning coping mechanisms, learning ways to manage their um, to manage their emotions. I think all those speak to promoting resilience uh, and to kind of give an idea of what we've been doing here at United Way. We actually have a, um, a Midlands Reading consor uh, Consortium that allows volunteer readers to come in and help address low proficiency, uh, proficiency reading for some of these students in elementary school. And I think the presence, the consistent presence and reliability of those volunteers and tutors goes a long way in helping those students develop those healthy and uh, trusting relationships as well. So I do think uh, schools throughout the Midlands do play a role. And I would just add that you can't have resilience without equity, right? So when we think about resilience, we often think about it in a, a positive way. Um, so we think about it like a, a child's able to overcome their experiences, you know, they're able to overcome maybe living in a disadvantaged or violent neighborhood. Um, but what we also don't think about is the kids that choose to then engage in drugs or cope in unhealthy ways, that's still resilience too. And if we want good resilience, that's really where that idea of race equity comes into play. Um, in order for schools to be resourced, in order for there to be these positive nurturing environments for kids, it means um, changing the ways in which we um, fund education as well as the ways in which we are responding to problems, right? So I recently saw a study that actually suggested that SROs or school resource officers impact children of color. Um, and increasing them is maybe not as equitable as maybe increasing mental health supports in schools, right? So there's, there's different approaches we can take to really promote healthy ways of, uh, of resilience. I, I do think that I'm biased. I love Resilient Richland. I think that they've done an incredible job looking at ways in which that they can do that. 
both from a school level, but then on a public policy and organizational level as well. I'll add very, this very quickly. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, the two programs um, highlighted by Adi and Andre, Jose de Richland, and, um, and the Midlands Reading Consortium. Uh, I, I think uh, there are two incredible examples of, of, of real leadership that's affirmative leadership that steps in, address, addresses a need, and when you do it, you do it right. It's amazing how we see um, children that that some people gave up on very young in life. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the children who, who uh, uh, I forget uh, what the what the statistic was, the Richland statistic on the number of ACEs uh, that some children have before they're five, six years old. Um, the um, um, babies suffering from PTSD when we know uh, each and every one of us on this call knows because we we have been them or we've actually witnessed it. Now, genius that knows it because I mean you have amazing uh, young people gifted in so many different ways who just need a shot who who who, who need that equitable opportunity just to, to live up to their full potential whatever it happens to be and uh, we ought to uh, again we all of us as leaders ought to ought to ought to I don't believe it to be a crime uh, for for the those of us in the greatest and most powerful and wealthiest democratic nation in the history of the world uh, for us to still be grappling with some of the challenges that we're that we're facing with it. So obviously those two programs and, and they're, they're two of, of, of several across this uh, community uh, that um, serve as an example that 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 you know activism without active activism without action is just a conversation. You can't sit there and admire a problem. You actually have to get involved and decide that you're going to address the problem. And those are two wonderful uh, ways in, in which in which United in which United Way uh, has has been helping uh, lead uh, the charge. Uh, so one one is one as a matter of fact, I, I actually um, uh, I shared uh, with folks at the White House, the, the former White House, um, just a few, a few a few years ago. It's just an example of of of, of just real uh, leadership. Uh, we've got some real and serious complex issues. Some of you may have seen the, um, the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Just the came, numbers came out yesterday. Uh, it showed that um, 50 Americans uh, control more wealth than the bottom 165 million uh, Americans, uh, which is not very different than it was pre-pandemic, uh, but we've watched that gap grow significantly. Uh, and, and, and those of us who, who may not be in the middle class or, or uh, in the highest two uh, quintiles of society uh, are, are watching our fortunes go in the exact opposite direction. We got, I mean, we got some major challenges, and it, it's it's uh, it's affecting our children and their abilities to succeed, and and what and achieve what what we still uh, refer to as the American dream, uh, which has become a much more uh, distant reality for some of our children. So. Another question wasn't for me, but I had I felt the need to say something. Yeah, afterwards. life. Thank you. It's for everyone. So thank you. Um, and thank you guys for shouting out that because Book Bunny is one that is true to my heart and it does support MRC. So make sure that you guys do support Book Bunny and I'll talk more about that if anyone wants to know any more information about Book Bunny. Next question is we're going to go on to is um, there are so many hindrances or limitations put in place that prevent diversity and inclusion across the board regarding healthcare, education, homelessness. Um, can you discuss the ways prejudices and roadblocks are built into the system? And Mayor, would you like to have a uh, uh, Sure, and I'll, I'll be briefer. Um, on my response here, I think Adi did a really good job as she talked about some of the structural issues uh, we face, uh, literally Im embedded in almost everything that we um, uh, we deal with as a, as a people, as a, as, a, as, a, as a country, and certainly as a state and a, and a city, is, is we have to uh, seek to um, either unwind or at least broaden the, the uh, barriers, uh, lower the barriers to entry in almost every aspect of what we do. There's some places where it's a bit easier uh, to do it, and some places where it's just incredibly difficult. You know, some um, some easy ways are maybe around around contracting. You know, for example, you know, and procurement, and and giving uh, businesses the the seed capital or low cost capital to 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 participate in the American economic experiment. We 
And we've had some strides here in Columbia, some that preceded um, our leadership, um, but some that we've really stepped up. You know, um, uh, people don't know that we, you know, we're, we're, as Columbia, when I became mayor, we were the um, city with the largest water sewer system in, in, in the state. Now we have the largest water sewer system that actually happens to own a city. And we've invested heavily in infrastructure. We, 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 we've spent um, $700 million. By the time we're done, we will have invested in water, sewer, um, wastewater, and also stormwater, green infrastructure. Uh, but probably a billion dollars. Every billion dollars creates 15,000 jobs and all the amazing uh, 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 opportunities, contracting opportunities that come along with that. We've been very intentional and, and very deliberate about making sure that those opportunities uh, would go to women-owned firms, would, would go to minority-owned firms, uh, 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 African-American-owned firms, uh, whether it's building out water, sewer, stormwater infrastructure, or building uh, Spirit Communications Park. Again, intentionally making sure that not only larger businesses, but also mid-sized businesses, local businesses, uh, to the point of us training um, uh, over three dozen individuals uh, came from transitions and from the Columbia Housing Authority uh, to, um, to uh, uh, lay bricks and hang sheetrock and, and, and the like. And, and once they finished their program, they were given a, uh, a, a tool belt and, and several have stayed uh, in the um, job force uh, since then uh, and, and had been out of it uh, for, for years before that. But just being very intentional to, to find ways to, to use the public trust, to use the uh, public funds uh, to try and pull more and more people in, in, into the city, recognizing that being a truly um, uh, a vibrant, alive, in, in, inclusive city means that you have to give folks opportunities uh, that, but for your action, they would not participate. And we believe the city is supposed to be a, a, a platform for human potential, that if someone wants to thrive, they want to do the things uh, that they believe that they've been um, uh, empowered and trusted to do, they ought to be able to do it uh, in, in, a, in a city that, that serves as a, the center of the economy, serves as a center of social lives, serves as a public square where we all gather and, and participate. But you've got to work to make sure that it is um, inculcated in your policies and, and, and then you aggressively try to pull apart structures that, that, that prohibit it. It's easier said than done. Uh, um, they're, 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 are a legitimate um, uh, entrenched interest, and uh, but but trying to find people who understand that um, we don't have to give everyone else your slice of the pie. But how if we work really hard together? How about we grow the pie uh, so that more slices for everyone to truly participate? So I would just add um, to that, um, and this is a fact actually I learned from you, Mayor Benjamin, um, about how I think. I hope I get this right, 70% of, of kind of businesses in the city limits are nonprofits. Um, yeah, so it, thinking about um, inclusion, diversity, equity in terms of nonprofits, and many of you all may be engaged in, in that work. I am at a nonprofit. Um, I think we have to think about what we mean by inclusion. So I think that a lot of nonprofits in Columbia, they got their diversity down. They have a wide range of perspectives. They have people of different colors, faiths, backgrounds, and that's great. Inclusion is the hard part, right? Inclusion is um, really then giving diverse perspectives decision-making authority. So when you look at the executive levels of a lot of nonprofits, they look the same. And so I think that when we um, go back and take a look at how we're hiring, what qualifications we, um, we include in the hiring process, as well as um, you know, who we're putting on our board of directors, it, do you really need someone that has a lot of money to give or can it be someone that has a lot of social connections and capital in that way that can really open the doors for you in a, in a completely new community that you haven't been able to touch? We've been doing things the same way for so long. And this isn't just a problem in Columbia. I think this is just um, across the board, right? We get comfortable in the ways that we're doing things. That in order for us to really see inclusion, we have to go back to asking why we do things the way that we do. So particularly for me, it's been really um, helpful to understand what inclusion really means in the context of nonprofit settings. Um, and I think that that could be applied in other sectors as well. Um, how can we elevate the voices of people of color um, in decision-making um, abilities? And, and how do we make sure that one you know, person of color isn't speaking on behalf of even the diverse community within um, you know, the black and brown community here? So um, another metaphor, because I know you guys love these, 
is um, to me, I really think of diversity as inviting different people to the dance, right? But inclusion is asking them specifically to come in the middle of the dance floor. We, we, we're, we're inviting everyone to the party, but who's actually in the center having the most, time, most fun and, and most importantly is able to really um, engage authentically with people at the party. So think about it that way and think about the ways in which it affects your life, whether it's if you're a grant maker and you're giving grants, think about how in which you create that grant making process all the way to if you're in banking and real estate, right? How are you um, promoting or supporting your colleagues of color that may be in the same sector that maybe don't have that same visibility or social connections that you do um, to really succeed in their business? Thank you, Oddity. And I do love your dance metaphor. <laughs> Andre, is there anything that you want to, to add to? No, that was definitely out of the realm of my expertise. Adelie had not seen me dance, by the way. She hadn't seen me. It ain't pretty. It ain't pretty. So uh, I don't know why he's rolling his eyes at my great metaphors. Okay. Well, so I, I, love, I love metaphor. <laughs> I, love, I love it. I love it. I love it. I, it was very visual for me. I was thinking of it too, like in you know the high school dances when everyone's like you know lined up against the wall. So it's it, great. It's, it, and I'll say this: it's, it's interesting to hear um, Andre Goodman say that's out of sight of space because I'm, I know. Oh but no, because I can I can think of very few people I know who who aggressively reach out to different types of people as as an appeal to so many different types of people and and, and works to bring them together under the very same um, umbrella. So I mean. I, I appreciate the humility, my friend, uh, but, yeah. but, but, but uh, there are some people who talk about it and others who actually do it, and, and, and you, you've done it every, every day I've known you the last, the last uh, many years. I appreciate the compliment, Mr. Mayor. I would actually argue that Andre does a lot of inclusion because I have the fortune to work with him on the coalition work that he's doing, and he has been incredibly intentional about who comes to the table to make decisions about this coalition. So much so that we like extended the timeline of that process itself. And that's an example of being flexible to make sure that you're being inclusive because it was important to him that the 29203 community that they're working with through Resilient Richland actually has authentic voices represented at the table. So I, you're doing it. <laughs> you are. Thank you, Andre. Okay, so one of the other questions that was brought up quite a bit was, what's the appropriate way to address racism when you witness it? We would love to tackle that question. I, I don't know if there is a, a right or wrong way. I, I would say, uh, just from my perspective, growth and advancement it requires discomfort um, and as much as directly attacking or addressing acts of racism as you see it obviously that those are individual decisions that you have to make I, I think I would say how would from a humanity standpoint how would you respond if you were witnessing or witness to domestic violence how would you respond if you were a witness to child abuse uh, I think whatever centers you as a person that allows you to want to do better for the next individual should be the equal response across the board, whether it's racism, abuse, or any other acts that seem to, de uh, to devalue an individual. Uh, and I would say I would, in the moment, it's always tough because you always act on impulse, but I think as I've matured, I've learned how to kind of have a dialogue within that conflict in a way that, you know, may ask like, why do you feel that way? And then maybe offer another perspective to see if what they are experiencing as a person who may be the offender, is it, is it based in something real or is it just based in, you know, individual hate? And some of that stuff, I, you, I, I don't, I don't get into those interactions. If, if hate's in your heart, I can't balance that for you other than me choosing to ignore it and be above that, that uh, uh, particular moment. Uh, uh, but again, I, I, won't, I don't think there is a right or wrong way. I, I just think for each individual 
it's different. But for me personally, I always choose to attack it in the moment because, you know, I, I wouldn't want to see uh, someone I love being harmed by acts of racism or any other act, no more so than I would want to, to see the stranger that I've never met have to experience it. So if nothing else, at least address it when you see it. So I was just going to add to that, um, that the first thing that I would do is if someone shares an experience that may have been, uh, you know, seeped in racist undertones or um, prejudice, believe them. Um, I can't tell you uh, how many times, you know, inadvertently, um, you know, it's in human nature to be like, oh, well, I don't think they meant that. And I've learned um, the hard way that when you say that, you're minimizing the experience that someone has taken on the burden to share with you. So I think I would say the first thing is to believe someone when they say that this has happened. And then I think that this is a really great opportunity for allies. I know that there's a lot of allies um, on, this, um, on this call today to really step up and be able to, um, you know, use their um, positions of privilege to have tough conversations. Um, sometimes it does take, um, you know, a white person saying the same thing as a person of color to be heard. And that's really frustrating. And I hope that that changes over time. But some of the, the, the best moments I've had seeing, uh, you know, an unjust situation be mended is when allies step in and say, this is not okay and we're gonna do something about it. So those are just the two things I'd add to Andre's really good response. Uh, I, I, I agree with all that's been said, and uh, Andre, I, I appreciate your initial comments because I think it sums up the way many of us uh, somewhat approach these situations uh, and, and how they, my approach has changed over the years. Uh, as, a, as a very young man, I would, I would probably blow my stack and, and have a, um, um, a very uh, uh, quick response. As a young mayor, I, I remember Bob Coble calling me uh, after witnessing the first few city council meetings when people just, I mean, you guys know, we, we're, we're in the public square now. People will come to the microphone, they'll say anything. I mean, anything, any, anything. And um, uh, the ideas of, uh, of, of shame and being accountable for your words. And I, and I felt then even that it was my responsibility because I was mayor, because I was sitting there uh, in, in, that, uh, uh, in my official capacity to almost to, to always respond in, 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 in real time. And it turns into an argument then, and obviously and no one knows who the guy is at the, at the microphone, but they, they know the mayor is sitting there arguing with some dude. Uh, and, and that's what makes the, the news. And the mayor, uh, Coble, he said, just, just basically said, just chill. Chill and, and uh, wait till they have a seat if you have to say something. And I decided then that I'd even have a, a role when it came to public uh, discussion, city council meetings, uh, where I'd, I'd let people have their say. And, and, and yes, you're right. If, if it's, if it's uh, someone who's obviously misinformed or maybe it's someone who, who obviously has gone through their own pain, it's visible. Uh, that's one thing. If it's someone who's just somewhere else in, in the world, um, you can ignore, ignore it. But uh, if, if, as long as some, someone doesn't say anything that's openly racist or misogynistic or sexist or anti-Semitic or, 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 uh, or homophobic, usually, uh, I'll, I'll just let it slide. Let, let, let them bathe and bask in, in their ignorance and, 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 and go on. Uh, but, I'll, but I'll also follow the rule that silence oftentimes means assent. And, and, and you've got to speak to it in, in, a, in a way that, again, um, recognizes um, of the importance of human dignity. And you have to find some way to, to, to bring it to a, a point point that that works again to bring people together uh because there are still so many forces and more and more forces particularly in, in the in the digital age in which we live where people have both reach and anonymity uh people are more likely to say anything because they don't have to own their words and it's so much um so important that um that we're necessary those of us who have some type of a uh, a, a platform bully pulled through all this on on this on this uh zoom call it's important that we use it and, and, and speak uh, directly to it, but always remembering that our words are the speech with the power, but also edify people. You got you, you got to bring people together. You got to um, speak to the, the the basic goodness that most of us believe exists in everyone. So, you, but you, so uh, speak to it, but you, but you got to bring it back home uh, as well when you do it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think that is so true that especially silence just is in 
their mind sometimes that you're disagreeing with them. So I would like to go ahead and thank everybody, all the panelists for being here. And I wanted to open it up to any questions that any of our participants might have. And if you do have a question, just please unmute and then I'll answer it. And really quickly, just to kind of break the ice, because I know people do get a little nervous to ask questions. Um, as you all know, it's 2020. If I've ever learned to roll with the punches, it's this year more than ever. Um, so we had some issues with the poll earlier, um, and I've been unable to get the results, which is totally fine. But I guess something that we would like to hear from maybe one or two of you is, did you answer one way to a question at the beginning of this conversation? And then, you know, this past hour, had you felt like you've learned something that has changed your answer to, yes, now I do know this, or now I do feel comfortable having this conversation. So I think that that would be really great to hear if a couple people wanted to come forward. Yes, Kay, thank you. I'm gonna ask a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I want to know, um, so in the last question that you asked, it's different when it's a child involved and not just a grown-up being a racism toward a child, seeing a child being mistreated in that way. What would the response, you can't respond the same way if it's a child that can't defend themselves. What would be the best way to handle that situation? maybe a trained professional on the call uh, who's probably better to answer that question than uh, <laughs> a, a dad of two little black girls who, uh, who probably didn't act most appropriately when he first in, engaged. <laughs> I, I, I'd say this, Ms. Ms. Higgins, I think, I think you, um, uh, when it, in our, in our house, uh, we've endeavored as, as, as all families, uh, I think, try to do, to preserve our, our daughter's youth, uh, to, to, to allow them to, to, uh, um, to grow up and, and because there's so many, so many of our babies who, ju who just don't have the luxury of being children anymore, who, who at such young ages are, 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 are required to, to, uh, engage in tasks and including parenting and, and, and teaching and having to worry about their personal safety who, who ought not have to worry about, 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 about shelter and safety and security and food and nutrition. I mean, all the things that, that, um, uh, that our babies have to have to go through. Uh, I think when, when, when we see our, our children, um, subjected to, uh, over, uh, uh, racial activity, I mean, I think we have to speak to, and I, I think we have to speak to it in a way that not only addresses the issue, because oftentimes you can you can you can deal with the issue. You get you get you got a voice. You're willing to be engaged. You're willing to be involved. You're willing to speak directly to it. You'll find someone in that pipeline of accountability that you can you can you can you can snatch someone by the collar if you need to. But you but you also got to make sure that you're speaking to that child and helping that child make their way continue along along that journey until until they're edified and fortified to to step into adulthood. And I think that's. Oftentimes, we're, we're oftentimes we, we often uh, miss miss these uh, uh, these adverse childhood experiences, and, and, and we and we don't help our babies continue to build. And obviously, a lot of that stuff tends to boil up. So, I, I think being open, active, vocal, being humble enough to also recognize that we don't have all the answers. Uh, you know uh, that oftentimes you got to bring in outside help if it's elected help or or appointed help or or professional help. Uh, the, the reality is that uh, I, I learned something on this call. I think we all learned different things on this call. Mm -hmm. There's power in humility and recognize we can't do it all ourselves. If, if you're not constantly learning, uh, then, 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 you're, then, you're, then, then the, the, the story's over. You, 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 gotta, you gotta become good at not knowing, but, all, but always learning. So I think if, uh, if you're helping a child deal with something, if you can't do it yourself, I think always reaching out for help uh, to others that to help you and also to help uh, help that baby, and and, and don't let someone. And in, in addition to, I think, humility being a strength, I'd, I'd also say that um, don't mistake confidence with competence. A, a lot of folks will, will, will tell you they, they, they got the answer to have the swagger and and, the, and everything else. They don't have a clue, 
you know, um, this we, we are engaged in lifelong learning. And, and, I, and I, I do believe, obviously, that while we're not only paying a debt to our ancestors, we're, we're and more importantly, um, paying it forward for, for these babies who I am convinced are going to save the world from us. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Higgins, for your question. Does anyone else have a question or would like to share anything that, any aha moments? I had a question. Um, so if you wanted to have like a conversation with somebody about um, microaggressions, because I know like that's kind of harder to like convey to somebody who like hasn't experienced that, like how would you go on to like have that conversation? So I think that there are a lot of, um, I'm not sure if you're asking organizationally or like with a, with a friend. Um, so with a friend, I think that you can have a very honest conversation and share why, you know, um, saying something like that insinuates um, or perpetuates stereotypes, right? There's a lot of resources out there to help you have that conversation. Um, and I'm happy to share some with you. Organizationally, um, one of the things that we've done is we brought in an outside facilitator to teach us about that. And because it's not another staff person, um, because the conversation can definitely get uncomfortable, right? Because we have to be uncomfortable to grow. Um, I think that that's stuck with people that it's not okay to say things like, oh, well, you're brown, so you must be good at math. Or like, your English is really good, right? Or can I touch your hair? Even though, and I think the most important thing we learned out of that conversation was it's not about intent, it's about impact. Regardless of whether or not your intent was good or it was curious, the impact that it had on that person um, is, is much more damaging. And so I'd highly recommend um, checking out some of those resources. And if you're interested in doing something like that for your organization, I'm also happy to share um, the folks that we brought in at Children's Trust. Thank you for your answer. That was really nice. And it was um, like a more personal like conversation rather than like an organizational thing. Thank you, Nancy, for your question. Is there anyone else who would like to ask another question or has any aha moments they'd like to share? Yeah, this is Drew Shavon. I know. Uh, hey, I know uh, that we were running short on time, but I just wanted to thank all the panelists and. This question is really kind of for, for everybody, so forgive me in advance. Um, but just to be completely honest, because that's, I think, part of what we wanted to do tonight. You know, as a white guy, I feel, I feel kind of awkward sometimes trying to figure out how I can be, you know, out of the, you said, an, an ally um, without, you know, overstepping maybe sometimes. Um, and obviously to be on this call too, you know, I think there's a lot of people that want a call to action. They want to know how they can help, how they can get involved. Is there anything in y'all's minds, just one example even, whether that's, whether that's a law, whether that's a policy or procedure in Columbia or the Midlands that is actionable for us to change to help take a small you know, step um, in driving towards a more equitable you know, community? That's a big question, but it's something that's been on definitely Deanna's mind too, I'm sure. <laughs> I'd say, I'd say very quickly, Drew, and I'm sure there are probably a number of different answers. Um, we all have positions of responsibility, official uh, fiduciary responsibility in the institutions in which we work, uh, uh, in organizations, uh, the, the, the boards and, and the like that um, Adity referred to earlier. Uh, I think um, spending time in those organizations where, you, where you're a recognized leader um, listening. I, I, I'm going to say, I, I think the, um, one of the greatest benefits of, of the most challenging year that uh, we, we've seen from the pandemic, the economic disruption uh, to, to social un, un, unrest, is that it's, it's, we, we pulled a lot more voices in, into, into the, uh, this, this, this multifaceted dialogue, and, and, and including voices that heretofore have been completely excluded uh, from, from the conversation. So, you know, I was joking earlier and I said, you know, um, uh, grandma used to say, God gave you the two ears and, and one mouth for a reason. You're supposed to listen twice as much as you talk. And, and I, I really believe that this is a wonderful time for listening. 
and I, and, I, and I think within the spheres of influence uh, that, that you have, I, the, asking exactly what you just asked uh, to, to, to some folks is a great way to start a conversation and just spend more time listening. So, you know, I, I, I want to do more. I want to do better. I want to make sure that this community is a community in, in, in which I, I can grow old and, and, and retire in and whether my family can grow up and prosper and, and live up to the full potential. I think, and I think you ask those questions and I think you'd be amazed at some of the answers and ideas that, 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 that you, that you get. And, uh, um, but, but it starts with, with uh, asking the question, showing the openness and then listening. And then when you get, then you get some opportunities to actually um, uh, secure that trust with action uh, based on, the, on those types of conversations, then I think you, you move it up to the next level and you're, you're able to keep on, keep on going. So just one man's, one man's opinion. Mm -hmm. no, thank you. I, I like to answer that. <laughs> I say, um, for me, I want to promote unity everywhere I go. I'm, I, I get out, go out of my way to go in another neighborhood and go around other people of other races, and I put my children around them, and I do the same thing because we're all in this world. We need each other, and as soon as we figure that out, the better the world will be. I think my call to action would be to continue to challenge your circles. So we're more likely to be around people that look like us. It's just human nature. And so there's probably a not, a, there are probably people in your, in your friendship or social circle, Drew, that haven't started this journey and the, the, the privilege that you have to be able to, to help them start that journey um, really can have an impact on so many people. I think organizationally, um, there's a lot of questions you could be asking in terms of different policies, uh, whether it's HR policies, hiring policies, promotion policies, to kind of change your structures to be more equitable. And then in terms of public policy, um, you know, I've learned that all, all politics are local. There's a lot of different local um, and state level policies that you can get behind and, and really do grassroots work around um, while promoting why it will help um, kind of promote uh, racial equity. Um, and I'm happy to talk offline what some of those would look like. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you, Drew, for your question. And thank you guys for answering. Um, if there's not any other questions, I don't want, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So is there any other questions before I go to our thank yous? I don't have any questions, darling. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, darling. I won't embarrass you, I promise. But uh, <laughs> uh, from a more simplistic approach, I put myself in the other person's place all my life. Before I open my mouth, I ask myself, is this something that I would like to hear? And if it's not, I don't do it to anyone else. So from a simplistic approach that has always um, uh, help me. And I remember there was an individual whose child was, um, they had um, a rare cancer and they were looking for bone marrow um, donations. And the one, the one and only individual they could find that was a perfect match was an individual of African descent. And they asked themselves, this individual unfortunately did not believe in any other, you know, had their own beliefs. And they finally had to ask themselves, how different can we really be if this individual can donate bone marrow to save my child's life? So uh, from that perspective, how different can we really be? And uh, I am so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> very proud of you. Drag you all around the world to different places, and I always wonder how that affect you affected you. And you learn so much. You're you're so diverse, and uh, you can adapt to any situation. Love you. So proud of you. <laughs> I won't embarrass you anymore. I'm <laughs> proud, mom. <laughs> no one uh, can be more proud. Thank of you. No one. <laughs> Well, I think it all starts with conversation, and this is the reason why um, this is so important to me, because it started with conversation with my friends, and to see how that grew, it was important for me to share that with as many people as possible. So I want to say thank you.
to everyone who participated. Thank you, Mayor Benjamin. I know you're a very busy person, and so thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. And thank you, Oddity. It's been a pleasure meeting you, well, virtually. So I hope after COVID, you know, we can, <clears throat> yeah, do a happy hour or something and have more fun conversations. And thank you, Andre. I know I've seen you a lot with, you know, our participation with United Way. I do know that Kay wanted to say some thank yous as well before we got off. So, um, Kay, did you want to speak? Thank you, Deanna. Um, and again, I just really want to reiterate what um, Deanna said. You know, we are so thankful for our partners over at the City of Columbia, the Children's Trust of South Carolina. Um, you know, we're just very thankful. And I think really quick, one takeaway I want to learn is I think in this climate, no matter how you look at it right now, we're so used to having a right and a wrong. And I think right now the biggest thing is not right or wrong, but either a willingness, a willingness to learn or not having a willingness to learn. And I think the fact that you all were here today and were present shows your willingness to learn. And, you know, it's amazing. And I just want to thank everybody from the bottom of my heart for being here today for this conversation. And I think, you know, like Mayor and Dr. Oddity and Andre all said, you know, you can, it's not always about the dollars or anything like that. So we, you know, over at United Way have so many ways for you to get involved and make a difference in the youth and help them become the young leaders. Um, so please reach out to anybody. We would love to get you plugged in and just thank you all. Um, I hope you all have a great night. Mayor Benjamin, I know you have another call and I'm so sorry for that, but everybody else have a wonderful evening. Enjoy your meals or anything you to do. We're glad you're here today. Thank you for inviting me and good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you.